Ja, Goed, ik doe even heel kort de intro. Vandaag hebben we weer een gast deze, Martin Krooploch van de OWASP Foundation. Goed zeg. Um, we hopen binnenkort weer een OWASP meeting, ook chapter meeting te mogen hosten hier. We moeten nog even kijken of dat kan, maar ik hoop dat het gaat lukken. We hebben we in het verleden al een keer eerder gedaan, heel interessant. En um, ik durf niet voor mijn beurt te praten, maar betekent dat ook weer dat, uh, jullie, dat ze dat dan gratis mogen volgen? Jazeker. Oké, okay. dus dan mag je dan ook nog eens gratis bij zijn. Hartstikke interessant om te volgen. Um, over application security in bredere zin, web security, al die dingen. Uh, Martin is volgens mij de voorzitter van het Nederlands chapter. Eén van de. Eén van de voorzitters, sorry. Um, <coughs> en die heeft uh, zich bereid uh, verklaard om vandaag een gastlezing daarover te geven. Over, uh, al was web security, application security enzovoorts. Dus dat zit weer in een logische volgorde. Op, volgt dit op het verhaal van vorige week, PKI, SSL, al die dingen. We gaan dus stap voor stap door. Nou, er zit ook een uh, uh, wat praktijkgerelateerde dingen in. Kijk eens, dat werkt. Dat komt vanzelf naar voren. Schrijf weer uh, mee. Deze, mogen, uh, uh, deze lezing wordt weer opgenomen. Hij is gewoon weer in het Engels. Ook. Um, deze kunnen we dus ook weer publiceren. Maar goed, je snapt dat het kost, het flink wat werk, dus dat proberen we zo snel mogelijk te doen. Dat is, uh, Elmer hè? knikte. Ja, maar één zo'n film maken kost het ook inderdaad 20 ja. uur of zo. <laughs> Omdat het, is... het full HD is en het zijn ja. twee stromen, dus ja. Dat is... Dus echt een online, maar we doen, uh, het, is, uh, het is wel even wat werk om het te masteren nog steeds. Dus schaaf jullie begrip daarvoor. Dus kom ook vooral bij de... Les. Bij dit soort dingen, bij de les, want dan heb je in ieder geval de talk al gehad. Um, dat vergeet ik voor de rest nog. Um, dit is ook beter te verstaan als mijn hoort dan via video. Ja. Um, nog wat andere dingen, wat opmerkingen. Um, de mensen die hebben meegedaan aan de uh, Intensive Week. We gaan nog kijken of we even iets van een soort bewijs van deelname daarvoor kunnen maken. Ja, degenen die er waren, die hebben ook hun naam opgeschreven om die reden. Dat hebben we even geregeld. En, um, het andere is, um, inmiddels hebben we ook ter, terugbericht van de KPD, van het team Hightech Kruin, van Chris Ornick. En die zei dat hij uh, in mei wilde komen. Dus we hebben een voorstel gedaan voor, voor een datum al. Daarop, dat hebben we gekozen op een uh, dag dat jullie uh, standaard al lessen hebben van uh, de minor, om het even handig te plannen. Dat moet nog bevestigd worden, maar ook die gaat door, alleen dus na april. Heeft iemand enig idee waarom dat na april is? <lacht> team Hightech Kruin, KPD, doe ze gok. Ja? NSS? Heel goed. Ik ben er achterin de NSS, de Nuclear Security Summit. Volgens mij is er 40.000 man politie op de been dan uh, vanuit heel Nederland allemaal in Den Haag zitten die dan koffie te drinken en donuts te eten natuurlijk. Nee hoor, zonder gekkigheid. Maar die, uh, uh, ja, die kunnen gewoon natuurlijk niet weg. Dus dat moest even na april om die reden. Oké, okay. nou, uh, ben ik klaar voor uh, Martin? Ik ben klaar voor. Oké. Dus uh, we switchen over naar het Engels. Ik doe weer even de sound sync voor de microfoon zoals 3, 2, 1. Oké, okay, Engels. Je hebt een German accent, dat was weer 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 Dutch ears. Je hebt German speak English. And uh, for me, uh, thinking and talking, thinking has a higher priority than talking. So sometimes I get a bit like start mumbling and I'm a bit chaotic in my head. So I try to be slow and make it possible that you can follow me. If I see blank eyes, I will try to go back to the red line. But uh, it's not an intention of this lecture that I stand here, talk, 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 and you think, okay, I've been there, done it, go. Keep it in the act that I never do rhetorical the question. So if I ask a question, I expect an answer. Ooh. Let's try it. What is this? Matrix. It's a screen. It's a screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a matrix. Why show in the matrix? Application security is mostly about what people see, what they assume they see, and how it behaves. So we all are humans, aren't we? Anybody non-human here? No. So we have to all are trained and raised to think the same. We all want to be different, but if we different, we are the same again, and everybody thinks the same. There has been a, a Dutch television program, maybe you have seen it, when they have people can volunteer, give the house to burglars. So they leave the house as they always would do, and they hire a burglar and they break in the house and all the webcams and the burglar breaks in and goes through all the rooms. Have you seen that? And what, where do all people keep their jewelry? No rhetorical questions? Where's, where's jewelry? No? Oh, who's what? 
rings. Bedroom, give up. Right? Sorry? In the bedroom? In the bedroom, of course. In the night cupboard, next to the bed, because mainly female, when they get out, the first they do children's on. I don't know why. Bedroom is the most common place. What is the second place where I look for children from the value? The bathroom. The bathroom, because the showers of people put into the children. And then, if you have children, they are younger than, let's say, five years old, they cannot reach higher up in the cupboard. So now people store things of value in a child room, because nobody would expect something uh, value to be there, high in the cupboard. But it's a typical place that people always do. And they think, oh no, not a child room. Yes, of course, it's a burden. He doesn't care about your child. He wants to get in, something where you get out. Your child, I don't care. They don't care. So what would be the best spot to keep stuff of value in your house? In plain sight. Sorry? In plain sight. In plain sight, in a shoe box in the middle of your living room. It would be the most safe spot because they would ignore it. But if we all would do that, Oh, no, so that's we are trained to think, to act as human as we are trained to. There's very small difference in culture. When I started developing, I was developing headed lines. So you have a big application, you know, or good old waterfall, you sit down and then where you find this function of educations and you lock yourself a, a bunch of tip elbows, you lock yourself up in the basement, you code for one and a half years and then ah, that's a product. Nobody need one of it anymore. But then you get this user manuals, very thick manuals and trainings, user training. So the users come there, they get a training for a week on how to should use this application. All the books, the presentations, slides, and so the first bunch of uh, users are trained. Only a few of them because no company will put all the people using the application there. So the second are trained by those who have been in training. In the third uh, generation being trained by those who once heard about somebody who had a training. These days we have web applications. Do we have user manuals for web applications? Do you, when you, you visit web applications once, don't you? You use the web? Have you ever seen a, a manual? No? FAQ? So, kind of. But there is no manual, so you expect people, they go to your application and they can right away use it. So they should be able to expect something from your application. They can see your application when they think they can use it and it should work. So we build applications that are intuitive. It's even a job. People are developing, uh, designing, web designers, oh, nice job. Defining applications people just can understand. So what we are looking at, what I try to show you, to look at applications a different way because everybody expects the same thing, maybe you should expect something different. Of course, if I train you something and you hear something new, you think, hey, that's cool, let's try it in my bank book and all. It's all for knowledge, not for enrichment. It's not that you say, oh, let's hack my, my bank. I'm rich, and a couple said you are allowed to do that. Don't hack the production one. Who knows which pill is which, which pill did uh, Neo take? Who thinks the blue one? <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks the red one? Can everybody lift their arms? <laughs> <laughs> there are no physical limitations to lifting your arms, huh? So, who thinks the blue one? Who thinks the red one? You're right, the red one. Okay. <laughs> so, as I said, when we write an application, we have to first the specification and the technical implementation. It's still there, still, even in Scrum, and we have used stories, different words, same meaning, smaller. When I started uh, software development of security, they asked me, from, do you have an elevator bit? Because I started about talking about software security, I started talking for hours, people got tired, fall asleep, so I needed a pitch. I said, well, can you give me a pitch? One sentence, what software security is about. My definition is, an application is secure if it acts and reacts as expected at any time. So who agrees with me? Who thinks that's a perfect definition of a secure application? Who does not agree? Wow. Who has no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. 
What is the problem of this? Is there a problem in uh, Stim? Well, an application might react the way you expect, but someone might be interfering somewhere in between, for example. But and then? If the application is still, you, still, you expect and you get the same result, but maybe some problem. In the middle of um, your yeah, transport. Right, right? Yeah, the question is where is the boundary of the applica uh, application? So, a applica uh, application yeah. can be that nobody can listen or remain in the middle in the application. So, what is the problem? Is the expectations? Who you have written software, programs, code? Really? Where you got the expectations from? Your, your specifications? Where you get them from? Users. Users? Who said that? Okay. Oh, yeah. Users? Yeah, the, the specific other user. I mean the the, the other one. Client. Yeah, the client. The, the client. The client. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> what was the client? Sorry. It's a business. Somebody with a back money, isn't it? It's a business. It doesn't really know what he's talking about on that technology. They know very good what they're talking about. What they have to do in couples. They think about one thing: running a business. Well, business risk, making money. They don't think about application security. We have hackers since the 70s. And what did we do? We went up to the business, look, this co command shell, look, I have access, I have root to your mail server. What do you think what the business thinks? Who? Good for you. Well done. Go back to the basement. <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about. So we have to teach them. They see the same in OWASP. That's actually where I understand. That's always going to be later on. But always had changed the mission statement. Always was founded in 2001 with the mission statement of finding, fighting, preventing the cause of unsecure software. All software has to be 100% secure. Yes! No? Why not? It's impossible. Is it impossible? Yes. Why? Because you were errors. You were errors. You were errors on the software security, isn't it? Well, there are always like bugs in software, so they made by you. Yeah, the question was, is it a bug? It's a good one later. Because we have limited, we have to deliver, and so it has to be good as it is, good enough. We can make it better than needed. So always changed the mission statement in 2008. They said from, hey, what we need to do is making the risk visible so the business can make the right decisions. So tell them, hey, yeah, if I've got a scale change in my database, Maybe have either no database or everybody has your database. What do you want? And tell them about what the risk for your business is. They, that's what they understand. We have a function specification and a technical implementation. One thing you should build, the other one is what you deliver, what you build, what you deploy. I did more than 10 years software development. I failed to ever make it 100% match. Is it possible? to build only what is expected. What do you think? Maybe we should put a little light on there, it's a bit dark, they're getting asleep. <laughs> Come on, you build software, don't you? Yeah, what kind of technology do you use? Java, PHP, uh, PHP. PHP. PHP, yeah. But only when you make it for yourself, then it can be 100%. Can it? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Who agrees with him? If I build my own software, it's 100% what I want to do. The problem is, PHP, Java, .NET, it's all the framework. Every functionality, do you build it by yourself? No. It has so much time. So you're using framework, libraries, extensions, and they're made especially for you. No, they're made for a wider scope, so you always import functionality you never wanted. And sometimes it's just no time. Or the, uh, Specification change, so you never build all the specifications because it's just running out of time. New specifications. That's why you can go to Scrum because we don't build for the next two years because it's small. But actually, in the technology, we cannot build all the need. It's one area where, I, where it's like that. It's in the medical area. I know guys they uh, wrote software for the I call it when you put it in and then they have this uh, magnetic radar and they scan you. Radar. Yeah, MRI. There, what they do is actually taking the C code, NCC. NCC did not allow 
take it out of source code. What's the framework? We don't need this. We don't need that. Why? Because it's about human lives. That's the highest risk there is if the home, human life is in danger or more. Personal more. But in software development, do we do that? Like, oh, cool, we have this nice framework. Oh, I don't need this part. We don't need that part. Why not? That's how we should do it. Takes too much time. Takes too much time. Yes. And then there's a new version out. And oh, which parts did I need and not? It gets very cumbersome. It's a good question, actually. Where do you get your framework libraries from? Where do you get the framework libraries from? I download them for free. <laughs> Maybe open source, yeah? Yeah, get them. Yeah. There was a, um, a company, they do a static code analysis. They have a static code analysis tool. And they said, open source software is not safer than or better written than closed source software. And it was like, oh no, <laughs> don't kill all open source. So who thinks that closed source software is more secure and better written than open source software? Or at least one. Who thinks the open source software is written better and more safe than <laughs> Who thinks it's both bad? <laughs> <laughs> How come? So it's all developers, they are developing functionality. They have all the same goals, all the same way to look at the source code. And you can say yes, and so open source, the more people look at it, the code should be better. But if it works, who looks at software that's written and does what it should do? What do you think? Nobody. Hey, just reuse it. It's been there for 10 years, it must be good. Isn't it? Yes. All is about expectations. If you see this sign, who do you have a license, a driving license? With a license for two wheels? More like. So when what did you see this sign? What are you expected to do? Slow down. Slow down. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> I'm a biker too. I was in Norway. Yes, Trollstigen. Looks right? like Trollstigen. Trollstigen, yeah. Perfect. I see the sign, it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not what they expect me to do. They have, oh, be careful. Relevance, deep, danger. I thought, fun, fun, fun. It's very hard. We always have different expectations than maybe the one who will. So a short side kick for OWASP. OWASP, as I said, it's a non-for-profit organization, open source, the Open Web Application Security Project. We were found in 2001, web was hot, so we had needed web in our name. Other thing is, everybody says, ah, it's OWASP, you're only doing uh, web security, isn't it? No, it's all about software, do more than that. Let's just go about overview and all of that. But what we do, we have three pillars. One is the people. People are organized in chapters like the Dutch chapter and one of the two chapter leaders in the Netherlands. <coughs> we do in three chapter meetings. At least six we try every year in the Netherlands. And we have one uh, local event, the Ben and Lux Day. We do together the Spanish and the Netherlands Luxembourg. Has been last year in the Amsterdam Rai. Next, this year will be in Luxembourg. And next year we also will have the next one, the bigger one. We have uh, upset conferences with the America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, Latin America, the next year will be in the Netherlands. This year will be in Cambridge, UK. Next year will be in the Rai Amsterdam. And for students, we need volunteers. So if you volunteer one day, you want it for free access. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What you also have is the Google Sum of Code. You might be interested in that. So you know about Google Sum of Code? Google Sum of Code? Google pays you for writing code? Never heard about it. You can earn money <laughs> doing the thing you like best, writing code, isn't it? So Google Sum of Code, we also, as always, again put in some projects. One is the set attack proxy, and you get paid if you work for doing someone on this project. We have, uh, I think, two or three year project for OWASP. We put for OWASP, uh, Google, uh, Google Sum of Code. So that brings us next one, tools. We have different tools you can use, tools, everything, software, you can download, you can use, you can run. I will introduce you to uh, the WTE, or the Web Scare. Web Scare is the old HTTP proxy, but I'm an old guy, so I'm more used to web, use this Web, uh, web Scare. Set Tech Proxy is the proxy they use normally for the platform world. 
and we have process, we have documentation, how you should do stuff. O is, the O is for open, it's all for free. You can download and use everything we do for free, you can visit every chapter meeting for free. And you get free pizza on the train. <laughs> Hopefully next one will be 10, 10, April 10th here. So we are focusing only us on uh, focusing us only on the software layer, and that's very hard because where is the? There's no hard line between software and hardware. For example, if the application crashes because the lock, well, that's really bad. But say that the lock uh, appender is writing to a file and the file is for, yeah, is it whose fault is it? I would say it's a fault, but. It's always hard to say a very black line. So configuration-wise, if the application requires the HTTPS, and it's the top of the developers, all of the administrators all very good responsibilities. Also very important, we as security tester, we have only limited time to validate the security. When you have a project, it's like, ooh, high risk, you get maybe two weeks a year for penetration test. Hackers have all the time they want. Then we go back again. So that's out of scope. So the only the ones who come very close to the hackers, or the attackers, are the developers. But nobody is trained to do software security in the past. When I started a uh, software developer, I went to a lot of companies. And one actually said, I went there and they said, okay, you know, it's hard to get the way and find a way how to work. So you get your workstation, it's a very big monitor, small screen, like that. And sit down, get everything running, look through the source code, get familiar with the uh, build system, everything. So what the first thing I look at, to do is a fix me, because they probably using them because they have to finish or they have with very in a hurry or they're already satisfied with source code. So that gives you a very good impression of how mature and how steady the development is. And they actually had a price, get a bonus when you find a bug. So I was looking through the code and I was like, see, come on, like, don't touch this bug, this is my bug. Because <laughs> you are using the bonus for increasing the holiday uh, money. Actually, you should actually give money for writing less code. Because more codes, more chance make or make them false. But yeah, you have to pay somebody to not do something. That's very hard to measure. Uh, almost it's gone much known about the also fair. First uh, in 2003, then 2004, since then every four, uh, three years. But the top 10, what is the oh, top 10 about? The top 10 of, <coughs> sorry? Or that was until 2007, indeed. And everybody is just talking about, sorry? About the web no, it's about risks now. Ah. Completely different. Because, in the top 10, 2007, we described vulnerabilities. Now we're striving the business risk. In 2008, our mission statement changed, as I told you, like making risk, uh, risk visible so they can make the right decisions. So we're describing the risk. I have customers say, well, do you check your pen test or check the source code about for the worst of 10? I say, of course not. They're like, but you have a more Not really, but uh, I'm, yeah. Do something for almost. You have to do for also 10. No, of course not. But it's about 11, 12, 100 problems. Also 10 is really cool. When you find a vulnerability, you tell the business what risks they have. It's not about looking for also 10, we have to also 10 and you are safe. Tool vendors are saying that. Because you get a lot of tool vendors who say, hey, here, they have a limited list, and they check for the, like, the also 10, and they get a green bar, and you say, is it? No, it's not like that. But it's the understanding the business has. Business trusts vendors. Because vendors have nice presence. They take you out of the gold court, so you can't trust them. <coughs> and they say, if you have a green bar, you are safe, they think you are safe. They did. They do it frequently. They ask every tool vendor, what is it you tool can detect? They don't just try them with the blue eyes. You don't validate what they say is right. Just what do you claim you will detect? And all tools by themselves. And together, we only detect 45% of all security issues. That's not much, isn't it? Yeah. So, that is the best tool you have, is your brain. Because we have bugs and flaws. So, 
we talked about bugs earlier. What is a bug? What is a bug? It's a small creature with how many legs? Six. What? It's a spider. Ah. <laughs> you get a nerve. Okay, so what is a bug? A software bug. You have a pet bug. No. What is a software bug? When a program does something, you don't want it to do. The cause is different. What do you say? Somebody else? Unexpected behavior. Yes, but what? It's caused by a technical flaw. A technical something is not done technically right. Then it's a bug. For reason we know the old post cards you heard maybe from your grandfather's about. There was a really a bug in it, so the hole was not a hole because there was a bug in it. So the one was a zero. And the program failed. But these days it's not response anymore, it's your technical fault built in a technical system or something. What is a flaw? You hear about flaws? It's a functional flaw. So a bug is a technical problem and a flaw is a functional problem. For example, who of you has a game computer? There are many. Did you ever hear about V? Yeah. I have a wife, I'm married now, so I change the computer, so it's ours now. Aha. <laughs> you heard about Mario Kart? Yeah. Yeah? Sure. What is that? It's a video game. It's a game, what you have to do, it's a... A lap. And you have to do how many laps? Three, three. Oh. <laughs> you played it just a minute ago? <laughs> three laps. How much time does one lap? At least one minute, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I had better high scores. Okay, let's say one minute, one lap is sixty seconds. What is three laps will take you? One hundred eighty seconds. Good. Three minutes. Just as three. So you have always need more than. 180 seconds. You could upload the high score. We can show others how fast you are. The first high score they got was in the expected time, but then they got high scores in less than two seconds. <laughs> what, did, what went wrong? Nobody heard about that? They drove backwards. Sorry? They drove backwards. <laughs> no. Yeah. Backwards in time. There was a timer, yeah? They found the connection the stage. They found a glitch in the stage. In the? In the, in the, in the, in the track. Yeah, they found, the, they found the security problem, yes. So I'm old and long hair and motorbiking. I wouldn't I'd get rid of that. <laughs> so what they had, there was a timer huh, for 99.9 minutes. So they didn't expect that people would spend one and a half hours of their life <laughs> to get a high score. So they did two laps, and the third lap they stopped here and waited for the time to reset to zero. And then they passed. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't expect that. They didn't expect people have one and a half of, if you fail the one time, if they do again, three hours, ten hours of your life they have a high score. That's what they call a flaw. Functional expectations. They didn't expect the user to do something like that. Okay, they fixed that. So the timer goes for ages now, so you need months to wait. Nobody does that, apparently. I have heard about the high score again. So then at the high scores, they were like more than 60 seconds, but less than 80. Ooh, what happened? So what tells us that they have, they have more than 60 seconds, says us, they did one lap. But less than two laps, so what could happen? Come on. You all played video game, don't you? Mm -hmm. So what it is, when you do a lap, you get markers to, to prevent shortcuts. Yeah. But it did, technically, the markers only had a zero or a one or zero. Yes or no? So you do a lap, all the marks are set, and then you hear about the cross, and then there's a point in time it's either yes, you finish, 
and I have to reset one to zero again. And then when you stopped and went backwards to the right moment, that it counted the lap but didn't reset the markers. Then if you do that three times, hey, I'm there. Then one lap to set the markers and then twice just stop and go front ball backwards and right in time. That's a technical flaw because that was, come on guys, just tell one, two, three that you did. Oops. But the technical solution was not correct. Yeah? So the box, technical flaws. The technical problems, flaws and fun are, are functional problems. What do you think? Who thinks there are more bugs than flaws? More technical problems than functional problems? Who thinks there are more flaws than bugs? Of course, you're telling the people, blame the people who are writing papers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no? We talk to the fund designers, they say, oh, always more bugs. Actually, Gary McGraw from Digital Game did the research and said, it's even, it's about 50 50. That means that 50% of all security vulnerabilities could be eliminated before you write one line of code. Just looking different about to the world with functionality. So, a friend of mine, he, had a, he bought a car and he had a button on his remote control of the car. To open all four windows. And all friends were like, oh, that's cool, because they go to the car in the summer. When you ever have a car, you will notice how it is. And you push a button, all four windows go down. The moment you ah, reach the car, the heat, heat is gone. I'm a security guy. I thought, it's one button. Oh, it's dangerous. It's like, everybody's like, ah, you again. And then he said, yes, you're right. Said, oh, yeah. Yes, actually, it happened. They have two pairs of keys. So he has his key in his uh, bag, he is on a bicycle to his work, his wife leaves the house two hours later, and all four windows went down, because apparently in his bag something pushed a button, all the windows went down. He was lucky it was no rain, not rain yet. So that's how to look at functionality a different way, how it can be abused and used a different way. What is this? Rules. Huh? Rules. Rules. Still a house. You could live there. People live there. What is that? A, a car. What is it made for? Why do people build something like that? Defense. Defense. Not to get visitors. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently. They keep being attacked by visitors. This is Buick Berlinstein. It's in the South Germany. It's one of my favorite cars. I've been there many times. Mainly because they had a night back in 70, 1600. He was almost two meters. <laughs> he died in a natural death, even they had trouble with the church. But yeah, imagine two meters back then, the average height was less than 160. Then you find something that's two meters, like, hey, <laughs> you will be careful what you do. It was heavy built. So it's a very secure architecture because it's built on limestone, so they don't need a water trench. There's a problem with water trenches around the castle, isn't it? In what time have been the most cars been built? Yeah, when was that? <laughs> yeah? 500 to 1500. 500 to 400 years ago. There was a small ice age. Very cold winters. So you have a water trench and you have cold winters. There's a problem. <coughs> you know what it was? Sorry? Freezes, yes, like Napoleon when they, they want to invade the Netherlands. In first instance, they could only go up to the rivers. They were like, oh, what? shoot. And now, what did they do? Wait for the winter. And hey, 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 now we go. So, in South Germany, we have something you don't have in the Netherlands. It's called mountains. You may have heard about it. It's a limestone mountain, and it's actually this building. It's only accessible, by a, was this day the change for tourists, by a, a hole in the limestone. So you don't have a trench with a very narrow path upwards. And then the inner center of the building, the most important thing of the building, only reachable by a hole in the limestone. So to get in, you have to shut up your password, and then they would get you in or not. Cool. Is it 100% secure? Probably not. Probably not. But it has been evaded once. What did you do? It was not in the time they had planes. It was in the back, oh, in the Middle Ages. <coughs> they knew the password. 
<laughs> no reason, yeah. She gets in the direction of her. Kidnapping. the very stupid huntsman who sits and fall asleep next to the prison is the keys. No, she's not good for it. Sorry. They kidnapped the person who knew the password? Kidnapping? Yes. <laughs> they bribed, bribed the guy who was on the road. He said, hey, if you get us in, you don't have to spit in the road, or sit there again and have to lift the heavy people up. Like, beer, where's your life on us? Good life. So they bribed him. What is the best time to bribe somebody? When they're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <with> experience. <laughs> When you're there, when you're in war times, people are alert. So when you try to bribe somebody in war times, they just had a refreshment of the dangerous course on the awareness sessions. There we are. So what's the best time? In peace times. You know you don't you are not in war with this guy, but you know maybe it's useful to have somebody in there. To brought them, put him in there. So in the peace times you get make friends with this guy in the road. And in war times you abuse it. It's like a delayed attack. So it's not. It happened and we got to the castle. It happened only once. So imagine that would be that is a very, very uh, general generic uh, application security expectation architecture. We yeah, do we have to think about security. Before that, before someone attacks you. That's the software layers. You know, presentation layers is where the, the, the screens will be lot, HTTP was will be sent out, you have a web services, XML, if you have database connections, you have external system batch jobs, you have your business layer, application layer, functionality. So where would you have to think about security? Everywhere. <laughs> on the top left corner of the OWASP. Everywhere. Come on, more specific. Every outgoing part. Every outgoing part, very good. Why not in the ingoing? It's the same. It's the same, I guess. The out and ingoing part. Yeah. Yeah. Internal? Um, well, yeah, everything that's connected to each other. Um, more important to get. You're almost right. What? You're almost right. Because what you do with outgoing parts, you can't trust. You don't trust anybody, it's not in your control. The trust boundaries. So yes, we need a, dead, a trench, a high wall to defend everybody who's from the outside. But when you have an application, and you have the most time you know what user is in there in the presentation layer. Then you go through the application, and it's the application who connects to the database. So you don't know it's a anonymous user, it's an admin user, it's just a user. So the application does a request to the database. So you need security in depth and propagation of privileges. So you not need who is doing what and keeping the credentials privileges through the application. Yes, you don't trust anybody from outside, but you have to make sure that the right privilege has been propagated to make the right call to the outside. Okay. No application these days has their own database. I talked to a guy, a Cobol developer. You know Cobol? <laughs> it's, it's not a bad language. And they said, ah, oh, application security, don't, we don't need that. So why not? They said, we do not process customer data. You process data, yes. Well, where does it come from? From that database. How does the data get in the database? Those .NET developers. Oh, you trust those .NET developers? No, of course not. Ah, got you. Everything is, comes in from a shared resource and will be with uh, some output. So, most important software security is input validation and output handling. Most important. And then, of course, it has to work as expected. Yep. Like, the same as like, for the, uh, the easiest to understand about software security or software applications, is like think about like a physical, physical, building. physical building. How did you all get into the room? I don't. Good. 
<coughs> how many entrance and exit points do we have? Hmm? If you count windows now. <laughs> yes, because everybody thinks they do. What's about this? Is it that a window? This? So this wall, would it go all the way up to the concrete ceiling? <laughs> no. So we all have the uh, first uh, uh, access points we all see. The second point will be the access points you can create. We're there, but like in the, in the bird world, he doesn't care about what he's breaking. A friend of mine had an audio beach store, and a big uh, store window is about 10, 15,000 euros. And it, back then in the 90s, a lot of people, like chunks, they, they wanted to sell a DVD for 15 euros because they can live for another half day. So what they do is smash the 15,000 euro window to steal a DVD, which cost you like 1,200 guilders back then, to sell it for 40. They don't care about what all the broke down because they don't tend to pay for it. And I know a, a company, they actually had the permit, the outside was very well controlled, and they had motion detectors on the hallway in the inside. So they're in a garden, then around it a hallway, and then the offices on the outside facing side. And they had motion detectors on the hallway. But all offices got empty. What happened? They found one window was less protected, smashed the roof. They went from one room to the next one by trashing those system walls, nice big holes, just went all the way around the building and went out. So they knew there were most things on the hallway. That's what happened. So what you need for your application is to know who is in there, who is moving around. What are my secure areas? Like everybody bought something on the internet? Yeah. So when you go to the web store, when you want to go through the uh, selection, do you have to authenticate? No, because you're free to look. The storage room is open, let people come in. Every uh, temple, <coughs> every bump towards where you want to get, will you lose you 10% of the customers. So please come in, look at our products, of course. Then when you want to buy it, then you have to authenticate and give them a account number to send the money. There's another reason for that is the moment you have put something in your shopping basket, unconsciously it's already yours. <coughs> it's not very easy for people to, if they are already in the registry and have to, uh, to put it away and say, oh, I don't take it, just leave it there. Online we do it easier these days, but physical way we don't. So we have to find the bypassing exits and the short customer notification. That. Also funny. Uh, I walked through Hamburg and then I saw this sign. So does that make you feel more safe? It's like behind the sign, there are no weapons allowed. I didn't know they were allowed before the sign, but so I feel more safe behind the sign. Actually, I, I thought like, oh, funny. Back my back then girlfriend was like, that doesn't also make me feel safe because then you expect weapons to be around. Okay. Mm. Okay, all of us support the whole terminal life cycle. And for the guides, the basic guide is a building guide, how to write secure software. The code review guide, how to review source code. I can do it, it's brain damaging when you do it manually. <coughs> and frustrating because you see how other people write code. And the testing guide, how to test software security. And by that, we are supporting the whole development life cycle. Much more tools, stuff like this out there. And I like that. Big sign. There were no bicycles there. It was in uh, Iceland. One bicycle placed right next to the sign, no bicycles here. That's how people are. Like a sign from Business Model Dover. And then, of course, the question is how secure has the application to be? We said security by itself is not a reason. We have to make a piece of risk visible. So we get expectations in our software. For security, we have also implicit expectation. That should not be possible. My bank will protect my data, <coughs> isn't it? My doctor will not give away my uh, medical registry, is it? Let's hope not. Yeah, you hope not, but... Mm. So the ACS helps you to define the security level on the basis of the CIA, and then makes the implicit uh, requirements explicit. Implicit requirements I cannot test. 
And then, of course, about software security and the Stripe testing guide as well. How to test software? We'll get into that. I would say I'm a smoker. Anybody smokes at all? Let's do a smoking break. And for those who don't smoke, then do whatever you need to do. Yeah? <coughs> 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 Tien minuten.
vorne steht nichts über Ich habe
you can do it. I said in the first, uh, one of the first slides, a hacker has 365 days a year how we can access applications. How many times you get for well, uh, verified security application? Maybe a week, maybe two weeks, this one application, a year. <coughs> These days we have Agile, Scrum, DevOps, how many releases do we have? Every three weeks. And once a year, <laughs> you know, the security is okay. Problem. So what you can do is what almost ACS actually says: minimum, do an automated scan. Absolute minimum. Get a tool and at least look in the tool. But the tool has a problem. What can a tool not validate? Lost, indeed. Yes. Application works, the tool assumes it works as designed. And only a human can decompile the functionality and say, hmm, maybe as an anonymous user I should be able to see all the other data. So at least automated scanning and code review, I could do code review, it's really brain damaging. And then manual testing and manual code review, then of course you have the design review and the ITX review. But then, yeah, it's we also have the same software insurance maturity model that says actually when you do software development, how mature is your software development? And he talks that on four business functions, governance, construction, verification, deployment. So what do we do? What are the, does the rest do? It's like uh, I have a bicycle, you have a bicycle. As long as my lock is more, uh, it's harder to break, they will get your bicycle on mine. Yeah? <coughs> There's one flaw in this. If you need your bicycle, you put a lock on, yeah? You're all Dutch, you all have a bicycle, no? I got one too. After 20 years, never said bought one. But, so you put a lock on, then it cannot be stolen, but still you can punch the tires. How do you protect the tire, uh, tires? No solution. Yeah, you put it in a garden area, maybe. So, yeah, how far you want to go, how much you need a bicycle. So here it says, in the governance, 
do I have my education in place? Do I have my co in, uh, uh, construction? Do I have my system requirements in place? Do I have everything in place? What should I do? We'll get a high maturity. But also a sign is in India. Watch out, the children might be blown from the right side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is funny, isn't it? What do you want me to do? Speed up, otherwise you miss the child. Run towards <laughs> the danger. Sorry? Run towards the danger. Yeah, run towards the danger. <laughs> Push the child on the street. <laughs> okay, when you do a penetration test or a security assessment, what mainly do you get is to get a contract with the company, you have consultants, and you get one or two consultants and they pay for the security. What you actually do is become the bad guy. And you all see the CSI and whatever television programs these days. I'm, my, perfect, uh, my personal uh, favorite is Dexter. Yeah. Uh, Next? Okay. Mine is? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know what's my favorite. <laughs> So we see always the police, and that's actually what we should do. It's we should define our target. So what you always see is you see the victim. Hmm? He's dead. Kind of. And then what you see is like this is target all comes about. We have our pictures, we have the people in contact. And the same for our web application. We should think about what are threat shows, what is the threat, what can harm an application. So, to find somebody my generation understands, what is this? Desktop. Desktop. Uh, which one? How many desktops have been there? Have been there? Come on, who is a nerd? One. <laughs> yeah, one in a time, but there have been two. Oh, God. Start with the school. We should try it one. So, we define our assets. What is of value? What we really need to protect, yeah? And you bring that, it's our, our victim. And then we look in it, and what we need is a, a vulnerability. So what can harm our application? What's the weakness? Yeah? So we have our asset, we have our business, and sometimes it can harm our business. Vulnerability. And then, we have a threat. Threat can cause harm because it exploits the weakness to get to our asset. You with me? Okay, so what can we do against this harm? Where's it? seen Star Wars? Who has not seen Star Wars? Whoa. It's time to get a new uh, Disney Star Wars movie out. So what do we, those who have seen it, what can we do to prevent this threat to cause harm? The whole the whole that should be a fixed bug. That would be great. But they defined it's our threat. But you against our threat? X thing. Risk. Chance can harm. And if a countermeasure, something that prevents this thing to cause harm. They thought didn't work out. So that's actually how people think about risk. We have something we want to protect. We define one threat, and then we take the weakness. What is this? Hey! What are those guys? Orcs. Orcs are cool guys. There's one different. Actually, I was sitting at home, but then I had no wife, no girlfriend, alone hmm. in the night, sit writing a security report. And I watch German television, like being a bit at home. It's been you know, it's synchronized, I know, it's terrible, but I was not listening, I was working. What is the first thing the Urukai and Orcs did when they attacked the city? They planted a bomb. So they planted a bomb. The first thing they did? No, no. Yeah. They planted a bomb, yeah. Right, first thing. Very, very first thing to do is line up, hit the drums. Yeah. We are big, we are ugly, we are going to get you. Yeah, it's like, would hackers do that? Oh, yeah, loose yeah. yeah. sack, <laughs> anonymous. Oh, other question, who was there anonymous, anybody? Yeah. 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 No? So, they come up, line up, they're gonna get you. 
And then it's a problem, I uh, recall the story differently. But the first thing is, I think, first is it attack the walls, isn't it? Yeah, with the bomb. So this is the first that big towers. <laughs> Sorry? The towers, they push to the wall. Yeah. First thing. Because they first have to fight, they DDoS the wall. So apparently the Urkas are not that stupid, they can do engineering and construct towers that high enough to be on the right height to attack the wall. So they're DDoSing it. So there's one thing a city has made that you're not getting in, high wall is the first thing Urkas attack. Hmm. Then comes the bomb. Like Solomon says, like, the city is a weak spot. It's coming Kasi to Urkai, runs there. And poof. There's also a scene, and it happens later, but it's very illogical for uh, the movie. Maybe you remember, then the Urkais think of, oh, wall, it's physical barrier, not getting through. Hey, there's a door, it's made to go over, close. Then they attack the door, bring the big pig on the wings, and then it's a good guy, a good uh, magic guy, a good uh, wizard, how is it called? Gandalf. It's on his house, and this is future king. Like, yeah, I don't want to be a king. And the uh, gnome, <laughs> and they're like, ah, oh, the wall, the door is going down. What is what they do then? Yeah, and then next to the big door is a big wooden block. It's a small tower. They step yeah. outside. They tossing each other. Sorry? They tossing each other together. Around yeah, you toss a small one. Yeah. So <laughs> next big protected gate, there's a small tower, with a small door, no lock, no door handle, open, standing in the outside, he tosses, him, like, gnome tossing, and jumps out, and they kill all the old guys who try to attack the big door. Isn't that weird? So they've done everything to protect the city, then have a small door open. <laughs> so if there would be a hacker involved in the Lord of Rings, he would not line up. He would investigate, he would look, because one thing they have is time. And believe me, in cities like that, with not romantic ideas about it, it would be smelly. And a guard maybe is not allowed to smoke. So where will he go? Open the door, standing outside, fresh air and have a smoke. Actually, I had customers that did the same thing on the web application. What they did, they had a software, like a bad internet, and they have a firewall. Ooh. Yeah, say a physical firewall. This is DM. <coughs> what does DM set stand for? Militarized zone. Militarized zone. So, because we cannot shut it off from the internet because other people have no customers. Here we put our web server. Then another for, uh, segment. Then we have here our application server. What they have. Actually, that is what they call staging here in production. And then from the office network, people can upload the work, so it comes on stage, and when they push the button or have a time trigger, it's will propagate it to the web server. Mm -hmm. so, what they actually asked me, like, you know, it's called it's secure, but we have people outside. Bobby. Uh, we have people outside and they need to do this, so can we not make a door that they can inside and can change stuff here? Can we not build in the back door? Like, have you seen Lord of the Rings Part 2? Mm -hmm. How do you do that, if you need to do that? Build in the back door, nobody sees it. No. That's why I have KPN for remote working. Then we have a tunnel and not going here, but going there, and you are making your computer, your network, a part of the old network. Think about implication security. The meshes are out there already. What is this? You recognize the movie? Maybe you're a bit young for that. I forget her name always. Dominator? Huh? Dominator? Nee. No. It's with Sean Connery. You know the old guys. Huh? It's a, is it Entrapment? Yes, Entrapment. Have you seen that? It's no. very old, yeah. Yeah, maybe you've been young for this movie. But the great thing is, every security movie you see, you see the physical security is very important. Because almost the good guys break in, they put a floppy in, the floppy, 
probably in the computer, you know, probably the thing, the save button. If, if I can put it in the computer and do copy files, and the bad guys find out, and they're running towards them, and see like 20% copy. They're running closer by, 40% copy. They're getting uh, like the same level, 6% copy. They're running down the hallway, and then, did they or not copy all the files? So, it's very interesting, because when you put a hacker down there, like, oh, I'm in there. That's not interesting in movies. <laughs> So physical security is very important, but then back in the old days, we always focused on physical security because we had no internet, we had no network, we had our physical barriers. But then I said, if I think of our web application as a shop, if I have a shopping, shop room closed, I have no customers. So we have to define our secure areas like our storage room, because no customer gets in the storage room, is it? Except IKEA. <laughs> But then they, they change the boundary. <coughs> so let me go back to that number two. It's not finished. So we have the security problem, is it? What do we do to protect our asset? Who has seen a movie? So what do you do to protect them? The deaths are during build, during construction time. Shield? Yes, get a shield. But that's what our threat first, that's the, what is that? The Lenny Falcon. Falcon. <laughs> Who's flying it? No, it was uh, somebody else, but I forget the name of it. So, we have our threat, we have our asset, we protect it with countermeasure, having the force field around. So we are safe, aren't we? That's actually how much people know. We have one uh, threat, with one countermeasure, we are safe. But actually, we have dependencies as well. Because, whose car is that? <coughs> yeah. Somebody will steal the chocolate. So, we have our threat, we have our countermeasure, but we have our dependency. Because somewhere, this force will has to be filled. And so, we have to find another thread. What are those? Wookies. Hey, Wookies. Yeah. I'm more the... Uh, I prefer Wookies, but... I don't know how it's done. Heavy people. So, we have a dependency thread, and we have a dependency countermeasure. So, we are safe again, isn't it? But we didn't think that the same thread for this can also fo join forces, and then outbalance the countermeasure. So that's what we have to learn seriously. You all have uh, heard about the problem with the um, Fuji, Yoko, Fujiyama, what is the, I'm really bad with names. The nuclear station in Japan. Fukushima. Fukushima. Okay. It was one of the securest power stations who was out there. It could take an earthquake, it could take a tsunami, but it couldn't take both. That's what we forget. We never think of the chance and likelihood that more than one risk actually will happen. There's a book out there, A Black Swan. It's also a movie. I don't mean a romantic movie, a romantic book. The Black Swan actually is the same in the English language. Like, it will never happen. Have you seen a Black Swan? Because before they uh, uh, yeah, discovered Australia, they only were white swans. There was a saying, have you seen a Black Swan? Something never happened. And then, yeah, something happened very weird. They found uh, Australia, ooh, continent, and they had black swans. So we cannot think about what may be happen in the future, because we're always thinking from the past. That's actually what insurance is doing. They think from the uh, figure from the past to calculate just the risk for the future. But we have to look ahead, not behind. That's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's about for the uh, talk. So let's try to be a hacker. I told you, Obos has, has tools. One collection of all tools is in the OWASP WTH, Web Test Environment. It's not meant to be a competitor to, to uh, Kali. Have you heard about Kali? Backtrack, new version of Kali. But that's not the failure, that's the model training and collection of almost tooling. What you see in there? Oh, I can't see. 
everyone, all of us, all kind of tools. I use WebScare because I think for particular state it works easier, but the set web scare, uh, set proxy is much better today. So it's a the old C pairs proxy and other and build. So it's a collection of more open and free tools and free versions. So I start my HTTP proxy. What is an HTTP proxy? Who knows what it is? Yes. So our browser connect to the internet and that's our computer but for that connection as a traffic goes out or in we intercept and we can manipulate it. Uh, and we got our web code. Have you heard about a web code before? Yeah. Who said yes? <coughs> Good. So you know all the challenges. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. We will see. Come on. Now we wait. not count the measures are taken. So that's one thing. When you are like at CSI, look at it, but you see you have your forensic guys, you have your medical guys, you have people who are very good at talking and interviewing. For hacking happen you need to say you need somebody who is good in the technology, Java, ASP, uh, .NET, uh, PHP. You need somebody who knows about the application server. You need people who know the database, the database mobility. But all you get is one guy, that's not all. It will always fail. Because we, there's no money to do proper security questions on both. So it's basic authentication. And what is the user password? It was shown on the screen. Guess, guess, enter. And then we get our application. There's always the warning when you use it, you can download everything for free. I said you can independently download the web code application, web scan, and set proxy, but you can also can download the WTE, it's all on the website, all for free. And there's a warning. I'm running it on a virtual machine. Why? It's an unsecure application. When you're running an unsecure application on your laptop, your laptop becomes an unsecure server. And it's actually happened that somebody was working, trapped on his work environment, installed web code, running it, and other people were abusing his computer. So do not use this at home with internet connection. And I started. So what you get on the left hand side are all challenges. On here you can get hints, but please try first yourself to think and then use hints if you start. Don't start with the hints. You can view parameters, you can see the cookie information. There's a, a lesson plan how you can follow. You can see the Java files behind it and you can see the solution. Don't start with watching the solution. And it's a trick because the solutions are on YouTube and you should not use internet when you're starting web code. So you first shut down web code and then go to YouTube. Go to VM and watch it. Yeah. Okay. What do you see here? The first thing uh, is our method our proxy. This, what, is our, what are those? HPV <coughs> method. So, what are we most interested in as hacker? Yeah. Yes. You want to see if everything is disabled or we can have work, trace, delete, that stuff, track. But the most, if developers are good trained, then 
I get, I get information by post, I posting a request that something should work. Unfortunately, many PHP developers are not aware of that because everybody can do PHP. So if I get a website, I can do friends, sons, brother-in-law's nephew, and he writes a web application for me, and they check the post and the get parameters at every request I do. So someday I can manipulate requests. Of course, what the post to do can also a get to do. We go to that later. So those have to be enabled. I can say intercept request. So when I click on a button. I see this. What is this? This is request the browser forwarded uh, to the server. You see, the host ID, is, I run it locally, so it's the local interface. I see the user agent. I see what type, uh, content types are allowed. Refer header. Refer. Oh, I can check. Isn't it? Can I trust those information? Can I trust this information? No. It comes from the client. You cannot trust anything that comes from the client. Client side security does not exist. That's usability. What is this? How do I station? Can you read this? What is this? It's basic support. Uh, yeah. What is it? What is it? Uh, I, it's the username and password. Uh, encrypted no. basic support. Encrypted? Is it? Well, it's not encrypted, but encoded. it's uh, encoded. encoded. What is yeah. the difference between encryption and encoding? Encoded. You can uh, encryption. You can just. Uh, Decrypt without a key, or you have to crack it. And encoding, you can decode actually. Encryption is depend on its hash of encryption that is either make unreadable mm -hmm. or unchangeable. Encoding is put it in a different format that can be very easily changed back. It's like you say something to me, I remember it in German, somebody else, and he can translate it back to Dutch. It should be the same sentence. If there wouldn't be Google translate because it would screw up. So that's only in there to not break the syntax because basic 64 is used in, for example, XML context. In XML, you don't want to have a bigger than, less than science, unbesund science, they will break the XML format. So you go to basic 64 and it does not break the XML structure. So this is not. And we have more tools. For example, I show you the transcoder. And I can say with 64 decode, and that's using a password. So, HTTP authentication only uses base 64 to propagate the user and password. So it's only secure now if you use HTTPS, so your transport layer is protected. That's configuration again. I had a customer who said, I told them using password in your application is readable. I said, ah, oh, it's not. I said, yes, it is. No, it's not. Said, Look here. Because when you logged in correctly, it was said, when you make, you logged in incorrectly, you went to the error page and you had no HPS content, uh, contact anymore. And then it was readable. Yeah. Problem is, this day, uh, in the past, HPS was very heavy. So it was performance wise. Not smart, you have a whole application, a whole website under HPS. These days, performance, if HPS is your performance problem, you have different problems as well. So why not put in your whole website under HPS? It makes no impact, cost, whatever. I put in my username and password. What is my username? Uh, one question. Let me rephrase this question. My username is my identity. My identity you claim. I want to log in, I claim the identity to be a guest. Yeah? What is the password? Make sure it's not say yes. <laughs> That's correct. But it's something you know. <coughs> three factors, one factor of authentication. So if your identity you claim, it's the username, and you have then one factor is your password, that's something you know. What else do you have? 
something you have. What is something you have? A phone. What? No, <laughs> a phone. A phone. Yeah, a phone. Hey, yeah, yeah, a phone. A phone? A key. Something like a generator. A key generator, a code calculator, yes. And it's something you have. And what is another possibility? Something you are. What would that be? <coughs> Your fingerprint, iris scan, ear scan. <coughs> All the knee scans out there, apparently every knee is different. So three factor means you have, uh, that you have something you know, you have, or you are. I once had a customer, he said, yes, we use a two-part authentication, we have used a password. Failed. I said, a new code review. First thing I looked for, and it's something the always see for every challenge, you get a description of what you should do, and then you have to do it here. But this one says, and it's always the same, developers IDEs, an independent development environment, helps you when you uh, have things you can't finish or should be better, you can put a to do or fix me in it, and in the task list and IDE, you can see an overview because you went through that goes through the code, can show you what you forgot or you still want to do. So, there are markers in the code, so things should be improved. So, if you want to look in here, what is the first thing we look at? Source code. Source code, how do I see the source code? Um, I'm not sure on that system, but normally it's control U. Yeah, you also can do the right button. Yeah, sure. You page source. And then what do you look for? You look for comments. Yeah. How do comments look like? Uh, in HTML it's um, marquee to the left, exc exclamation mark, dash dash, yeah. message. Yeah. So you have read this? Yeah, so we I read it. Look for, to do the fix me, I've done this both, I look for fix me. <laughs> and what you see here? So that's a very nice example. Who thinks that this really happens in production environments? <laughs> Maybe not use a password, but it happens for example by captures. You know the pictures which we have to type over? So many times you have to test code still in there and then you can automate it and stop. So I put in here admin. When you log in, it's a training application. It will tell you, congratulations, you have done it perfectly. Yeah? Right. There are a lot of Capture Flex applications. The most of them have no hints or small hints. When you are interested in that, <coughs> there's the OWASP BWA, Program Web Apps. It's also a VM you can download. There are many applications on there. It's the OWASP Web Code, Java.net, uh, the Bosch IT Store. Uh, real life applications like the Orange uh, CRM applications, so a lot of applications out there, you can download them all for free. Okay. When you are an attacker, when you are a bank robber, and you look, oh, watch bank robber movies, isn't it? Burglar movies, what is the first thing they have? You always see it is like this big boss, and he has his friend. And they want to, they play the scam. What they do, they have to the target already, is it? About the target, what is what they have? They always put it down there, like paper. Blueprint, it always has blueprints. Isn't that weird? Why do they have the blueprints? Isn't that protective? No, it's, it's, most of the time it's not a sensitive data. Maybe it's very hard to get on Fort Knox. But in most uh, buildings, you can get a blueprint very easily because they're not considered sensitive data. But then you always see them to go to the uh, bank or whatever they want, a the burger, and look around. You know, very casually with big sunglasses, fur coats, because the few have to distinguish with the rest of people. Nobody can recognize them. Why are they doing this? Why do they always go to the location? 
Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. What do you want to check out? Physical security. Sorry? To get more information about the place they want to rob. The physical security? The physical security? They, want, they know about the static structure of the building, but they don't know where to place the security guard, where to place the motion detectors, the camera, and stuff like that. The same is the web application. How do I get my blueprint of my application? Huh? Yeah, framework information, stuff like that. There are two ways. One is information the application gives you, and of course, can spy it. And that's a problem. When I have a security assignment, I want to investigate web code. Normally, that should be my attack. They say, okay, you're allowed to take, uh, test web code. What actually you want to do it is step one level higher because you need to see the sound. It's like in the Burger movie, they see a band, but they also take a look at the traffic around which building is next to it. Maybe there's an abandoned uh, metro uh, tunnel underneath it. Always good. So then always it banks on something you can reach from there. Huh? Really? So you want to find out about that. So you don't scan on the application itself. You just get one step behind and take a broader view a step and one higher level you can do. So what you can do is spidering, of course, not only that code, but one level higher. Because you get more information on the application around it. What you see here? You see, of course, our web code application and web code, why is it do I see it twice? Isn't that strange? It's case sensitive. Sorry? It's case sensitive. It's case sensitive, yeah. But that's also different in there. When I open this, so that is what I have been already. And that's what the server is build up. So one is the link where I appreciate attached, and the other one is the circular uh, configuration. But I see stuff I haven't seen before. I wouldn't see it on the uh, would not see the first place when I look at it. Uh, and that's a problem you can always find it. You also will see a uh, uh, web service for example. So when you test the application they tell you about yeah that's the URL to the application, but they mostly forget that there's also a web service behind it and stuff like that. The back doors. Then I find out about what application server I do I have. What is this? Tomcat. So I know the data structure. I know where applications should be deployed to. I know where my configuration files are. Because they're always in. Anybody use uh, Tomcat? <coughs> That's why you need also the knowledge about application. And Tomcat's always under the root directory, conf, and you have the Tomcat minus user.x now. They always have readable user files, unfortunately. Okay, so then I have my blueprint. I look at my application. So what should be the first we should test? The first thing you see is the first thing you notice. So as you said, we have our entrance points here our door, our windows, let's look at that. So when you would attack a bank, you are a bank robber. You would digitally, digitally attack a bank. What's the first thing you need? Blam. A blam, yeah, good. You need a blam. Mm. And you base your blam on information you can gather. So where can I find information about my bank? Sorry? Intern, yeah. You, you find people who leave the bank and then make friends with them. Very exhausting. So we have two ways. One is to contact the bank, but then you're detectable. Or the other one is reconnaissance <coughs> indirectly get information. So how do I get information about my software environment of my bank? Sorry? Google will be one. Is it traceable? Depends on where you look. So when you are uh, Googling for the bank directly, it's traceable. But what also can do is look for forums, like a .NET or a Java forum, 
where somebody used the email address from the bank on a Java forum, then I know they use Java. If they look on their job board or in a, a job hunting site, they look for a DB2 administrator, then they have a DB2 database. So it's all information they give you already without you contacting the bank. And then you need a step closer to information about the bank application. So first is we look at the internet uh, presence, look on what application service running there, what domains do I have. I can use Google for that, Google Docs, stuff like that. And then, so we have reconnaissance, all the information will still get closer to the target. And then, you need the target information. What do you need for that? You want access to their web application, isn't it? Yeah, how do you get this? How do you get a usable password? Maybe if you uh, go before and somehow you can get a usable password and it's the same password they use. Why not go to the bank and say, hi, I'm, Martin, I'm a hacker, I want to attack your bank, please give me an account. And yes, I need internet banking. <laughs> no, I normally don't say I want to. <laughs> but yes, go there, get an account. They give it for you for free. They are for free, you pay for it, but it's low cost, whatever you want. So you go there, and that's something that happens when you have a black box test. Companies always say a black box test is the minimum requirement. You can get a usual password. No, attackers never have that. Do it. Of course I have. I can go to the bank and make an account. Yes, you could, but our customers don't attack us. What? Yeah, very naive. They gave a limited time, and no, no information to the hacker, because the hackers have no information. Uh, so you actually want me to be busy for four days to find information you already have. And you pay me for that. Okay. No, I don't do that anymore. I stop with that. Stay with it. I want to do white box testing or not. Because nobody wants a white book test, I don't do any like face testing. It's all too expensive. Okay. Username was funny. So username is identity. Did ever uh, anybody of you ever uh, bought something on eBay. Do they show the username of the other guy who it's uh, bidding? Oh, person. No. Who thinks no? Who thinks yes? Then you're doing it for a very long time because they're not doing that anymore. Why are they not doing that? Why did they stop? Because for them it was really good because when I want bid on something, I see Janje is every time it's bid on something. I don't want to have a Janje to get this thing. I want it. It gets personal. But now we have no Janje in your name, you know. Huh. This who whatever it is, he's bidding higher. But why did he do that? Why did he remove the the uh, when you're bidding the username of the other bidder? It cost him a lot of money actually. Why did he do that? You are hackers, no? So we hold the ID so they can uh, know who the person is. So when they can have uh, You're getting there. What is one of the most difficult or more flawed, most flawed uh, functionality in every application with users? Password, login. Because what happened, the username that's on the screen is the same as his username when he's logging in. So I want to bid, but this young kid is always bidding higher than me. So what is the login procedure on eBay if I log in incorrectly three times? I get blocked. If I do it again three times, I get blocked longer. So what I do, he is bidding, I'm not bidding, I know who he is, I log in incorrectly, so I'm blocking him. Mm. Ah, I yeah, know you're getting it. That's why they removed the username because you can't do that anymore. Because you don't know who Jan K or Peter or Willem is. <coughs> you see, a lot of times when in the old web applications you saw either username incorrect or password is not valid for this username. You don't do it anymore. Why not? You could guess either you have correct username but incorrect password, or you know that the password is not matching the username. Weird, this happens actually. <laughs> 
So they don't want you to do that. So it says the combination of username and password is incorrect, yeah? So you can find out any username of the application. Is that correct? Do you think so? <laughs> it's no, of course not. If I, you register on the web application, then they say, username is already taken. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you know the usernames. So you may you just try, you can automate it, a list of usernames, and everybody wins. Every time you get the feedback when username is already taken, hey, I've got another user. The same what they did in Norway, they have a bank ID. So the bank startup said, you have a username and password, and you could do your banking stuff. But everything is great, so the, everybody started using it, even the government, like our uh, DVD. But the username for that is a generated number you get. Only like the trend proof for uh, credit card numbers, they were predictable. So actually, I can run a program listing me all uh, possible usernames for this bank ID, just randomly try to log in because I don't want to log in, but they were blocking all Norway for using their bank ID. Nobody would be able to do taxes, banking, online banking, whatever. That's scary, isn't it? A friend of mine, he was a student, he showed, uh, made a proof of concept of this, showed the government, you know what they said? Why? Nobody will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will ever do that. Why should you do that? Yeah, getting in Norway offline. That's really scary, isn't it? Okay, I think uh, people start getting tired again. One or twice, maybe take a 10 minutes break, move around. Physical movement stimulates blood circulation, stimulates <laughs> oxygen get through your head. But there, are, there are some other creative methods. I want to add something yeah. of finding out user passwords. You just find a different site that does not do this blocking. And then you just guess until you have the password, and then you're in on the first try on the other sites because people have a tendency to use the same usernames and passwords everywhere. Yeah. Thinking outside the box is usually the way to go if you want to do this. Yeah, because the website you're attacking maybe is protected, other website is less secure. You can use on other website the same password that we use for the more. <coughs> Surprisingly effective uh, yeah. method of LinkedIn business. problem. Yeah, LinkedIn problem or okay. Okay, short break.
something in its round and about the size of the coin and you get them. It was a company that had 70 or 80 percent fraud. So people put something in that's not money and less value of course and they get their goods out. So you get two options. You can either say from okay I get a more expensive vending machine, I get three options. Accept the fraud or I stop it. So by stopping it you will punish everybody who is liable and trustworthy. A more expensive vending machine was no option because it was too expensive. What they did, they put a picture of an eye on the vending machine. Did it help? 60% less fraud. Only because there was an eye, a picture of an eye on the vending machine, because subconsciously they felt watched. So interesting. Huh? Maybe we should other way to attack attackers. Attack okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
You all know about HTML. I said I do a lot of code review and <coughs> I get it frequent. So we have here a field of all HTML fields like this. So what is this? No rhetorical questions. Remember what is this? I dropped out. <coughs> what is this? It stands there. You can reach. A checkbox, input field, a disable field, a split button. So the challenge is to change all, how many are there? All six of those. How would you do that? Sorry? How do you change those? HTML. We have our HP proxy. We intercept the request. I push submit. But I only get five. How comes? One disabled field. Good. So what can we do now? Expect element remove and disable. Sorry? Well, if it's an HTML5 field, you can it's remove no HTML5. The you can uh, remove the disabled part it's of the yeah, so on, it's HTML, it's not HTML5, it's ah. very old technology. Yeah, I could do that. I accept changes. What I can do is then intercept the response and I do it again. This is a request, accept, go away. Accept changes. Then I get a response, and I can put watch in the uh, in the text file. I look for able, and I see the disabled field. I could only remove this. I don't need a response anymore, and I say accept changes. And you see, it's enabled. Actually, what happened uh, the second time I met my parents-in-law. Actually, they wanted to go for a uh, route from Wired. Of course, at a fixed place where they had the laptop. I don't know why, but all the people. And then they wanted to oh, go wireless, but they forgot the username and password. My girlfriend remembered like that remember the username, but she couldn't recall the password because her brother is more safe. He used password phrase. So what could I do? So she was trying, and, hmm, no success. Actually, it's your work. So I was released from the parents in law, go to my Happy World computer, and I downloaded the proxy, and what I saw was actually JavaScript, everybody read, everything readable, except one field, it was obfuscated. What is obfuscation? What is that? Obfuscation. Making something unreadable, giving a very strange character name you cannot pronounce. <coughs> So if I see a field, everything is readable, one field is unreadable, and it was a zero, and you're a hacker, what do you do then? Let's make it a one. Huh? I did. And I was administrator on the router. That easy sometimes. And then you have to explain to your parents a lot why you can do that. And people get how easy it is. People will recognize this. Uh, what Arne and I talked about outside, it's for uh, Forgotten username, we get a password. Its functionality is made, most of the times done wrong. It was a website, I forgot my password, so I said password forgot, and you say, okay, the nice cream, you want that uh, username, send your password to this email address, and submit them. That's weird. So I looked at this, wanted to look at the source code, I couldn't. The right mark, uh, button was disabled. Ooh, <laughs> that tells me something is wrong. So what can you do then? I intercept proxy, I saw the source code, and I can change the email address where I sent my own password to. So I'm call, I send an email to them explaining the exploit. Um, I actually can, every user, get a new password to my email address I want. You know what they did? Were they happy? That this does not make sense a lot for doing this? No, no. no. They threatened me with lawyers because literally they said I was reviewing their source code for their property. That's not allowed. Then I sent an email about uh, how HTML works. You give me the source code, otherwise my browser cannot integrate that. 
and maybe it's the wrong attempt, and send them a link to HTML for dummies. Some people just cannot help. Okay, so we do the submit button. Nice, uh, and then I can put in whatever I want. Of course. And say accept changes. Uh, and we are we are successful. Sorry, I just made it. Okay, so that's that easy. <coughs> HTML is a text-based uh, text uh, protocol. Everything in the text you can change. Same for hidden fields. I have here on functionality, you also have to use the browser plugins for Tempo data, for example. When I watch this, it's the page how it should look. You can buy a television for $3,000. Maybe the price is not up to date anymore. But what I also can do is disable the hidden fields. call it again and you will see that the main fields are revealed. When I do a source code review, that's one of the biggest faults because developers are not aware that hidden fields are just hidden, they're still there. You can change, manipulate them. So what would you do to get this television cheaper? <laughs> Sorry? I can buy a television. Half television? <laughs> What would happen then? Half the price. <coughs> like this? <laughs> Indeed. Would you get a television? Yeah, delivering a half television will be suspicious, maybe. <laughs> what would be if you do a negative television? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have not enough temper. So what do you do? Temper winning. Sorry? What is this? This is the I can buy it negative. Would it work? Would I be able to make a negative value? Would I get the money? Who thinks I, if I order a minus one television, who thinks I will get the, the money? <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> yes, you will. Because a negative transaction is still a transaction. At work. <laughs> Would I get television or will they come to my house and get one? They will come and take one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you will get television because a half television would be off, but minus one television could be a typo. That will work. It will actually work in Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who have ever booked a vacation or hotel online? <laughs> So when you book a hotel in a very, uh, in a t very busy time, what does the hotel way do? It goes up. Yeah. So when I, when is King Stay? King Stay? You have no Queen Stay? Queen comes King. When is that? You are Dutch, not me. Twenty seventh of April. Come on. It's your royal house too. <laughs> it's an interesting story. <laughs> the more German than Dutch or something like that. Um, uh, so, the 27th of April may be very expensive to get a hotel room in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Yeah? So, when you buy, what would happen if you book a hotel room for, for example, 27th of February? You have to do that. The hotel room is below, below. Yeah? So, you book it for a cheap rate. What do you do then? It's cold and oh sorry, you know, internet computers, very strange device, no idea what it's doing. But accidentally I booked a hotel room 27th of February. Whoever wants to go on some 27th of February. Of course I wanted to be here at King's Day 
I see you still have a room left. Please help me. What would they do? Switch Of course, it's switch today. Do we have to pay the fee? No, they have no idea because it's not in their control. The website calculates the fee. The, the lady behind the bar, uh, behind the reception, has no idea about what is the current rate. But when you book a hotel in a cheap day, they say, oh, sorry, please change my date, they will do it. Why do they not just say, okay, we cancel your reservation, please do it again? It's annoying for the customer. Yes. We, we could lose a customer. Now we have a paying customer, or we would have known. So this would work. But if we have a saturation of channel, failing. Of course, it's not nice to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. All you can do is this. Oh, no, I'm not at the temper. So we do it here. And as I said, it's a training application, so it keeps the feedback uh, successful. The most CTF applications, you need to find a token, and then you upload the token, you get your points. It's very automated. When you are more interested in a bit smarter CTF on hackinglab.com, or joint venture. So you have all challenges on hackinglab.com, they're for free. You have to register, and they're very, uh, they're Swiss guys, so they're very particular on keeping secrets, but they're not spamming you or whatever. And then you can do the CTFs, but there are teachers behind the CTFs. So the question is always what is the vulnerability? Prove the exploit but also tell the mitigation. Because if we don't want to train hackers, we don't want to train people to prevent on the software. And then it, you always deliver text answer so that you get a real people to answer and reviewing your uh, submission and real respond in, in person. So hackinglab.com, always challenges for free, and then you get a human feedback and not a yes or no. It's smart. Okay. Who of you has about <laughs> cross-site scripting? So that should be easy for all of you. <coughs> when I want to look for a cross-site scripting, how would you start? Look for input fields. And then? Uh, then try a simple script. A simple script? What will you do? Alert. It's not simple. That's not simple, come on. <laughs> Just yeah, let's get much simple. open a script tag. This is a, this is a re reflected for that scripting. Mm -hmm. Reflected means that your input will be reflected directly out. So you only attack yourself. So what you want to do is to see from if I put some values in there, oh, I just fuss, as I say, every field and purchase. I don't need this one for this. I see what information comes back on the website. So this apparently they went to the server and came back with a request. What you see here, actually, this is what I put in here. And here. So uh, apparently my input will be outputted again. So I can start again. And maybe I try to manipulate it on the other way. What is minus, uh, this one say? Spread it. <coughs> so I underline it. And I do purchase and I see that indeed it comes back on the line. So I see that my data becomes meant, uh, part of the contact. It's the most important thing by input uh, flaws, of the injection flaws. It's that data becomes contact. You want to separate always data from contact. The next one will be, of course, it's not really important yet. Next one will be the script. So then comes suggestion from him. 
already there. As I purchase, I don't get any feedback, did I? So I get no code scripting here. <coughs> Let's do it again, because I know there's a typo in there. Closing tag missed. Yeah, I know there was something wrong. Yeah. Now it's a script. And I see the script. But also, what I see, what I do, I see here. What is the information? What is this? Sorry. It's a cookie. Session information. Yeah. So I could steal then the session information. So everybody is a number on the internet and you get information. What do you do to protect this information? It's cookie information, the document and cookie. What you now what you did is actually cookie in the script context. There are two ways to protect the cookie information. One is the uh, secure flag on, still secure on, is true, then it's encrypted, it's only allowed to be transferred when it's on HPS and we encrypted, unreadable, and the other one will be HTML only. That will mean that it's only in the available, the problem makes not available for the JavaScript context. So then you would see an empty pop-up. So it will be pop-up because it's JavaScript, but it will not be allowed to access the cookie information. Is that browser side? It's browser side. It's only the new browsers mm -hmm. do that. The old browsers will not ignore it. And of course, our HTTP proxy will ignore it because it's on the browser, it's not made to be more secure. So it also is blind side validation, but it's always a small bit together to help you. So secure flag on, HTML only, and then it's harder to produce it. Because this one is exactly the same. We had for the, uh, I will show you in a second. The next one would be a stored one. The difference is the reflected one, it's just you attack yourself uh, to the uh, internet crime uh, lawyer, Arnold Engelfried. He says you're allowed to attack yourself. So reflected constricting is allowed as long as you do it quick and not too long. It does not mean it has to type fast, but it's just do it, prove it, and then. Uh, disclose it and do with it forever. So, <coughs> if you read the message, you want everyone to read it. So, some nice title, read this, because you have to read it, and then the script text, some text, then script. Everybody knows the script text? And somebody else than him? Anybody? Script tag? What about, sorry? Oh. Sorry? What was the question? Oh. <laughs> How do I write the script tag? Or pop up? He knew it. Come on. What should I type? No, but. What do you want to do? I know I'm all in death, but I really don't hear anything. <laughs> and here? Do I need a semicolon here? Who <coughs> thinks yes? No. Who thinks no? Yes, are the decent developers? No, it's those who know HTML because it has a deep. Ooh, not my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I missed it. Okay. Only the keyboard. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> HTML is forgiven, so they know that there should be a script and they do it for you somehow. So they will even without, but I'm a decent developer, so I do it like this. And then you submit it. This, of course, is now stored on the server side, on the database, <coughs> where I open this. Oh. <coughs>
I get also the pop-up. So will only be shown if I open that. So if it would be a modern browser, you wouldn't see it. But then, of course, we have our uh, <coughs> Oxy and readers, and I also get all the information I need here. Because it's always in the header. And the nice thing is, I do like that in the Constant Request Forgery, a lot of sites use <coughs> Google Analytics, don't they? This in the header of what is sent. Would it be part of the what is sent to analytics? What do you think? You don't hope so. Let's see. Let's go to the. Come on. Request forgery. So, content scripting makes abuse of the trust of the um, uh, user. The user thinks a website is decent developed, and apparently it's not. Because the input validation output handling is not okay. So, now we go to the request forgery. Again, a title, something uh, interesting. So the challenge here is you have to transfer fonts. How do we do it? So they say you need an image tag with this AUL. You should point to the CSF lesson, so to this one. So we copy this. some text and then how do we do an image tag? Sorry? No. 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 IMG. IMG and then space S R C quotes. Sorry? Quotes. Uh, equals equals quotes, yes. And I copy that in yeah. and then and then another quote. There's typo, you end it. Where's the typo? It says SCR. What? You close. And then? Uh, weight and height. Yeah, tell me. How do you define pixels? Sorry? Yeah. And then? <coughs> and then? Slash. You all just put this in. It's nice if you have an application that tells you how to attack it, isn't it? So how do I concatenate parameters? Sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry. That should be it. Yeah? You all agree? No. What? The slash is needed. What would you do? The image tag is not closed at the end. Doesn't need to be. It is. No, there's no backslash. No. no. Does not need one. If I have it like this, blah blah, then, then I have to close it with. Yeah. But if like this, I don't need it. Mm. I submit it? Then I do my. Okay. I open it, which is 
This is the first time I'm asking for it. And then you see again that's the next request when you get the image link. And that's actually the same, almost the same as would be done if you use Google Analytics. And you see the session ID is also forwarded to Google Analytics. Why is that? Because it's the context of the request of the header. Otherwise, the image will not be able to be part of your site. So Google Analytics has a lot of uh, session ideas. But we can trust Google, isn't it? Yeah. Don't do evil. Yeah. yeah. But then it will re uh, request the image tag. There's another problem. The server, the, re the receiving server, he knows not that I made an image, he only knows that there's a GIF request. There's no image inside. So again, the browser requests an image. The server who should deliver the image is not aware of what is requested. It's only that I get a URL and I should deliver the URL. And I get it. Also here, there's no clear communication, clear handshake. Unfortunately, it's broken, so it does not give you the right feedback. Oh. So who are the SQL gurus here? SQL. <coughs> He's smiling, so let's see. Then we go for injection flows. Let's do the number of injection. So you will see here, it's a training application, it also shows you the SQL will be executed on the server side. Every good company I know that do, uh, they hire, uh, who hires uh, penetration testers requires at least two years of professional software development. That's two reasons. One, they know how developer thinks. So when there is a function like that, they know how most likely the developer has implemented. And B is when you have found the vulnerability, you have to tell the developers how to fix it. In the Netherlands, we have a lot of software uh, functional testers. And then they're like, oh, it's a functional test, security test, both test. <coughs> we send somebody to a CAH, uh, Central Edge Hacker course, we have our hacker. Then he's coming to the developer, you do everything wrong. What do you think, what would be the response to developers? Like, whatever. They need to be the same eye high, not standing each other, not the pain. My first code review actually I did when I was not developing. I was I'm a trained mechanic. And I did PLC programming. I told myself, because it was a robot, when you get a robotics, I like a robot arm who comes in between the machine and mold, the mold closes, the arm is gone, and the mold is gone. So I made a developer and he always blamed the users like, what has the operator done this time? So I couldn't understand. So I downloaded the ladder diagram and read them and did my first source code review back there. And I found the found bug. Went and, oh, I found it. You did it wrong. What do you think? He was happy? <laughs> he was the developer. I was a small mechanic. I dared to look at his source code and had undecently to tell him that he did something wrong. That is not very. <coughs> it was a very short relationship. <laughs> you need to have the same experience, the same background to talk to each other and understand each other's pain and then explain how it should be better. And I see a lot of people that do security testing, like they did it wrong. No, they could have done it better. It's the way how to deliver the message, how it would be received. Okay, so, Mr. Esquel, I can select a weather station and go. How would you write the SQL for the injection? Who dares? Yeah? Anybody? You heard about SQL? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just close, close the brackets, close the quotation. No, oh. <coughs> A, it's wrong. <laughs> it's a number of SQL checks. And B, students, come on. Um, He's paid for it. He needs to know. Yeah? Finish the SQL, so just insert that number, then close it, then open a new one. Too complicated, easier. 
And you just like using R. R1 yes. is one? Yeah, one is one. You think you must. <laughs> Hacking is easy. And then? One equals one. Yes. And then I have to restart the lesson. So. Does to me every time. I will then have So let's go again. Come on. So or one equals one. It's, it's so basic, but it's still it's in so many applications. How should you prevent a skeleton check like that? <coughs> Almost to it. Prepare statement with? Um, no. Parameter has queries. A lot of people think, yeah, prepared statements, but I also can put a, a problem here is string calculation. So this all will conquer the data and will present to the database. If I do it wrong, I can also take this whole string concatenated input and be prepared. So prepare statement by itself is not a solution. Only if you use parameter queries. You heard about parameter queries? No. That will be my query. A bit of sight as I can read it. What you do with parameterized query is actually you take the query. And put a placeholder there. In Java and in PHP it's a question mark. You ask, it's of course a string. And string, oops, string. And you ask your connection, prepare query. So then you get a prepared statement. What happens when I do that? Is that the database will receive this string, scary string, or will already build up his selection tree. And also, he will take the query, make a hash, and restore it in his cache. So when the next request comes, in case, because there's no parameter that's say static, he will find it in his cache. No, he does not has to find out again how to build up the query. He can get it from his memory. This has always been seen as a performance improvement. People forget it's a security problem as well. Because then, when you've done that, then you say connection, a PS bin, uh, uh, it? PS bin dot set a value. And here I know it's a number value, so I can say set in and put a number in there. I should retain it. Like, uh, get parameter or whatever then and then I have QD depth because A I have performance update. I have the query prepared, the next tree is done already, so whatever SPN checks I try to put in there will not fit. And I can set the uh, boundary of my the type info as well. So it has only advantages, but a lot of developers do not, does not, do not know, and make it wrong. What is even safe, maybe safer than a prepared statement? Ever heard about stored procedures? 
Why are there safe prepared statements? Where does a stored procedure live? You have fixed input. You uh, can declare uh, what kind of uh, uh, yeah, variables. variables you can put in and where. Where does the stored procedure live? In the database. Yeah. Prepare statement. It's on the client side. Prepare uh, for stored procedure. I call by name on the database. I tell the database, I want to access this stored procedure with those variables. So the same security depth. But I can type save R query, and I can manipulate the procedure because it's on the database. It's, it's separated from the application. It's even more secure and it's better performance. But then the developer should work together with the database administrators. We don't need that. Developers have to learn to talk to testers, and now they have to learn to DBAs. Imagine that. It would be scary, isn't it? The developers live in the basement, and two floors below, they are DBA DBAs. Yeah? So it's with class. It's also for social engineering. The management does not understand how much value somebody has. And a COBOL developer, uh, or the old uh, C developers. The old, who's developer? Who calls himself developer here? What? You don't dare? Maybe? Developers, he sits in the outside, so he has no friends, isn't it? <laughs> Let's do it. Look, he's a check up shirt. It's a developers. We are not the most outgoing and social people, is it? What? Depends. It's the next generation developers. <laughs> so when you go to a COBOL developer, he's in the 50s, very frustrated, lonely. This was his mother on a seventh floor in a high apartment building. He says, hey, friend, oh, you have an interesting job. You're a COBOL developer. Cool. He will tell you everything. Isn't it? Social engineering. Find him with a friend. He likes my job. Okay. That, so much about uh, numeric rejection. Let's try a... Uh, String as well, check. I don't need this. So here you have to log in and find the name. It's an American application. So, what do you think? My name? It's not in there, apparently. There are top blocks in America. There's one major league player. Once. So that's not working. So what will be the next thing you can try? Come on. What would you try if you want to get information from there? First thing would be most common names. What's the most common name in America? Yes. Oh, I information leakage. And indeed, I would find everything from a John Smith. So, that's one attack. What would be the other one? How would I do a SQL injection? We just did it. Try that first. But, that's numeric. Uh, that was numeric. And now we have a string SQL injection. Ooh, completely different. Is it? Close quotes. Close quotes. Sorry? Where x is equal to x. Where? Uh, yeah, without where. So, or x. D dictate what I should type. Uh, Smith, or? I take the other word, otherwise. Uh, uh, wow. <laughs> that's, uh, okay, and then or? x is x. Would it work? Equals uh, quotation. Where? Uh, around the axis. Single or double? Uh, single. <coughs> Why not? Here? Yeah. One in the end? Yeah. What does the rest take? No. Why not? You already have one at the end. Yeah. So this one has to go. And then? Can read it better like this. After hello. Hmm? 
What? After how long? Yes, because we get. I have to close this one, I have closed input string, then I get the command, I open it, and this last one will be for free again. And we get all of them. Because x equals always equals x. Other one would be. do a quote, so I just put it in the empty string. What well, would that work? Yes. Why? You comment about the rest of the string. Yeah, the rest will be common. The data is really ignored. We start the lesson, of course. It's only with the SQL checks problem. Actually, it's, I talked to a guy from the uh, <coughs> Belgium uh, department, Cybercrime, and he had a talk. And they were like, he said, I don't care who attacks me because everybody in the CISO security office guy is like, yes, you have to need an attack uh, tree, you have to find out who will attack you. It's very important. He said, I don't care who attacks me. I care what they can get from me. Because who attacks me can be very different today from tomorrow. If you are a bank and you do good stuff, who will attack you? Bad guys who want money because what does the bank deal with? Money. So all attackers who want to get money will attack a bank. What's about hacktivism? Will they attack a bank? Could be. If you are a bank and you have financed some oil drilling adventure from a company in Alaska and they are blowing it up and all Alaska snow is black, because ice black because the oil is spoiled everywhere, then the ha uh, activism will also be against you. But it makes no sense to say, oh, I have to focus on this guy or those guys. What they actually do is separating on the skill level of people attacking you. What is the lowest skill level of people who attack you? Script kiddies. Script kiddies. What are those? You. <laughs> what are script kiddies? Um, people who use tools. Yeah, use tools, use scripts you find online. They try it on the bank. Hey, my website, my, my school website is offline. What's the next level? <coughs> they may not make any difference between hack and cracker, so the next level will be a skilled hacker with not much time or plans for the budget. The next level will be a hacker with tools, with uh, <coughs> time and budget. The next one, the highest one is? Hacker communities. No, this is a skill. The highest one will be state level because they have all the time, all the money. So you get from skilled kiddies, skilled attacker, skilled attacker with resources like. Eastern European for people like that, communities, then you can stay. We don't need more. What's about the users? As I said, I don't care who's attacking me. It's actually when I talk about this common problem, a friend of mine said he had a problem back in those days. He was uh, working on an uh, administrative page for a website and they had to change the production database. In a date field, is to be written like uh, PLS code, day day minus month month minus year year year. There was no input validation, and it makes a typo. Oh, hey, sorry, otherwise I'll be wrong. It was American notation. Year minus month, oh, yeah, month minus day day. And he made a typo, he wrote this. And the whole database in the third war, end of the third one of the year was changed. <laughs> yeah, we cannot trust the data because we also have to protect our users from not making extended mistakes. When I would make a website to protect seals, you know seals are fluffy big, uh, animals, small, fluffy, big, black eyes. Who would attack me? 
Van de Japanese? They, they eat everything but no seals. Scandinavian people most likely. So people who like to fish, seals. Yeah. If I would make a website, seal fishing in trouble. So for beginners you get a bigger bed and the seals are you straight on a cross bed that you hit them. So you can know where front and back is. For the statistics you get a bed with uh, nails on. And you get very cheap discount prices and stuff like that. Who will attack me there? Sorry? Activists. Activists, yeah. Everybody, and then you have social media. Everybody will attack you. Because everybody loves seals. Huh? Coat, fry. Will be explained by SKN checker and uh, or is one or one is one, but it's not only on this one technology. So here we have a web service, and you said you know all the challenges. <laughs> no. Not anymore. So here's a challenge: change the password of another user. How would you do that? For user 101, but I should change it for user forever, but not me. <laughs> so, <coughs> what should I do? Go on, guys. Now you, you have to do it. Just do another, just close the password tag, and then start another ID XSI. So, it's starting so here. Try that first. No. Oh. Tell me, what should I copy, what should I paste, what should I take? Close the password thing, first of all, and then just copy the whole... So this one the close? password thing is for free again, it's similar to the earlier tag. Yeah, so what should I do? Then start a new ID, is XSI, etc. You said I should take this one, yeah? Close password tag, and then? Open the ID, XSI, and so on, the different one. It should be nested, though, I think. Sorry? Something like that, yes. <coughs> and then? The whole password thing, except the last part. Like this? Something like that, yes. What do you think? We think that will succeed? You also need the Yuhu thingy in front, your own password. So you need to enter something. It? it might ask for it, I'm not sure. What do you think? Who thinks it will work? <laughs> Who has faith in the army? I usually don't do these. So. Yeah. 
When would you be without Amin? It was an educated guess, really. I don't usually do it's XML injection. Yeah, it's injection. the same thing as for S per injection. You see what you can get, and it's why it's good actually. It's because the sucks parser. The sucks part is very dependent on how you will implement it, and it's very fast because it's not going to the whole bunch and trust every input it gets. Hmm. So what, how do you prevent XML injection? How would you prevent this? Sorry? Parse on the server side. What do you mean by parse on the server side? Check the input and it's sent. What do you check for? Tags and stuff like that. So you would blacklist text? Wow. Blacklist? What does blacklist do? Everything you know that you don't want, you would blacklist. So what is big? What is bigger range? Things you want or things you don't want? You don't want the smaller range. Uh, at least the uh, yeah, blacklisting is not bad. There were times I said no blacklisting, but it doesn't work because you have encoding. You can look at the hack of the org, yeah. XS thing, and you will see it. Actually, what's very good for examples is Oracle. Oracle had a function. And it started with S Y S. It was the system function you could call. Oh, we do not allow that. So what I say? SYS is bad. Blacklisted it. So what did people do? S capital Y S. <laughs> oh, bad. Yeah, what did they do? First they started with both capitals. He wrote all that three months patch cycle. So first, small letters, who would allow it? Oh, no, no. Then, okay, we mix them up. S, Y, S. Oh, shoot. No matter, capital or lower letter, it should not be allowed. It's already <laughs> sweet water of a year later. So, and then, what will be the next one? Easier. When you get your browser on Japanese and make S, Yen S. Because the server is not Japanese, he is on European American side. So what does encoding do for you? It will encode it to the letter what is closest to the one you have. And so on the server side, it will become S Y S. Server is your friend. So it took more than a year. And then they said, oh, maybe we don't need this function. <laughs> Problem is with Oracle as well. What do you think? The most Currently we have Oracle 12 released. What do you think? How many percent of the companies running Oracle 12? One. <laughs> Oracle. <laughs> Less than 10 percent. The most running still number 10. Because they say, oh, that's kind of always um, a database very important, so we never want to be the first users and then one or two versions behind. That's it. I had once a company, they went from order 8 to 10. They, 10, they stopped uh, supporting 10 in the next two months. I said, yes, but uh, that is good. What do you mean? They don't give you any patch anymore. Yes, because they thought they wouldn't patch anymore because it's safe. <laughs> no, it's not supported anymore. That's how business is. A friend of mine, they had an uh, order was also a business about uh, blacklisting patterns. And actually, there's one more where everybody knows called table. So they wanted to a blacklist the word drop. You are all Dutch, you know. <laughs> oh my God, they want to ban drop. So a friend of mine, he had a, 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 a story written about the Dutch and the drop, and why the drop should not be blacklisted and kill the whole project. Because Americans don't know about drop or whatever. Like so blacklisting is not bad, but it's not so bad. Why is it? I said input validation and output handling. Because there are two, uh, uh, two camps actually on this area. When I get input, how should I store the input on my database? Should I store it encoded or raw? Yeah, the problem is we have our database here. It's our application around it, so we get data in there and now what? We have whitelisted, 
the play twist it, so we know it's really, really, really what we expect. Then we store the database. Go in. The question is where to go out. Is it HTML? <coughs> is it XML? Is it a text file? We don't know. That's why we have here with implementation and with authentic. So at the moment, you cannot remember what the bike. So the moment you the data leaves the application, then you know what channel it will be sent to, and then you can do an encoding for the output. So, but when I already encoded it on HTML, and then I need it for text, then you get this nice messages where this becomes a in your text output. So that's why as raw as possible, keep it there. And the moment you go on the output, then encode it. Okay. But you see here, is you can choose a help file and say view. This help file will print print it to the screen. How can a man play it? You see here already that what he does is a uh, starts laughing. <laughs> It does a command in the operating system. So how would you manipulate that? Close the quote. And then? Mm -hmm. I think it's double quote if I can call correctly. Mm -hmm. And then? Mm -hmm. How do I com uh, concatenate a command in Unix? Mm -hmm. You heard about Linux? <laughs> <laughs> you know how to use it? <laughs> how do I concatenate? You said that's the interest the active group, isn't it? Okay. Nah, come up. How do you concatenate comments in uh, Linux? And, uh, Sorry? And, 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 and and yes. Okay. Yeah. What would you do then? Whatever you want. Yeah. For example? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's to uh, it's a proof of concept, just do a directory listing or something. Really? <laughs> it's proof of concept, just do a directory listing. <laughs> if config, for example. Whatever. Let's see. return code. Let's do it again. Don't 
Und für Ja, most likely. Hm. Problem is, as said this is last one, but most of it is forgotten. We focus on application. And one is to have the one of the principle of uh, uh, security design, it's least privileges. And everybody thinks about the users. But what we get many times that all the application is a user of the system. So when we limit the rights, the privileges on the user on the application, we also have to think about the privileges of the application on the operation. <coughs> Mainly PHP uses a lot of uh, framework libraries in doing Windows or Linux calls. So the application, the PHP application, the PHP user, has privileges on the system required to run properly. When I can abuse it, I can take over the machine. And that's actually the command injection is the one why the warnings on it, because you can shut down and do everything is completely wrong. We use uh, on an application, we use something like that on a small company I worked for, and I was a friend of the system administrator, so I regularly switched off a network card and started that to tease him. Unfortunately, I didn't know when he was a vacation, so they bought a very expensive new network card because it's switched off always. Sorry, I never told them. So, security development is A, think about the user, what right he has, what functionality he requires. The business is good in defining expectation application, but only in what application should do. They always forget what application should not be able to do. In uh, touch points, what one of the SSAs, which is an app use case. So, we have an app use case, a use story of what should functionality should offer. And we have an app use case, what should not be possible. For example, a use case can be a user can edit and view his credentials. And app use, app, use, uh, app use case should be a user can edit other users or view other users' credentials. And that should fail, of course. Very beginning, before I, when uh, going through application development, you should be aware of the risk factor of the application, how important the application is to make the right countermeasures and make the right choice. But most of the basic thing is trained developers. They know about security issues, like use prepared statement with parameterized variables, use whitelisting instead of blacklisting, use the encoding first encryption, stuff like that. Things not aware. And then, of course, protect the user data. Everything you, you are involved with loses interest and loses danger. You all walk off the street and I'm stumped, isn't it? Daily. Who never crosses the street by red light? Everybody does, you're Dutch, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And you don't think it's dangerous. But what would happen if you do the same thing in a different country? Where the car is not aware of there could be a pedestrian crossing the street by red light. Right? Could be a that you can put a little bit dent in the car. Most optimist uh, approach. <laughs> Everything you do in day and base loses danger and lose interest. A developer on a bank application, a bank does not care about money because there are millions of billions of euros going through it. Making people aware of what is the value of the application and how to protect, how it's the value for the user, how to protect the user is very basic. And the basic code uh, sca uh, skills. I do in code review a lot, unfortunately, I don't want to say. And I told you about uh, the placeholder. Maybe I can see. I had actually somebody, but they did, they had perfectly put prepared statement placeholder in a query. And I looked at it, and it's a bit odd, but I actually did. Later on in the application, he did. For all the question marks, string replace and concatenate the values in the query. So it was perfectly set up to be safe. A lot of the fellow comes in and ruins it. Many times a small change can open big backdoors. I hope I see you in the next overshot meeting. We are 10th of April and it's working out. We have already one speaker. We always have two speakers. One speaker is a FES to make it a Dave Stein, who will have it open reconnaissance and tooling. More in depth and more technical than I did today. And of course, we will tell about the AppSec conference next year. If you want to be volunteer, one day of work, one free access to the conference, I think it's a fair deal. And I look forward to seeing you again there. The next all six meeting.
question? <laughs> All right.